so we're, on, we're going to review chapter 3, starts on page 37. Uh, the title is Steel and Other Metals, and this is for Weld eight, uh, 1950. Um, looking through this chapter, it's really the longest chapter in the entire book. It, it's over 100 pages long. So there's some parts in here that I'm going to skip that, that I don't really think is pertinent to what we're doing. Uh, and then there's some of it that I'm going to ask you to, to really delve into extensively. As we go through this chapter, I'm going to tell you to highlight this, put a bullet by that, whatever. And if I tell you that, you can probably expect that it's going to be on a, a question on the test. Um, it'll probably be a minimum of 50 questions on the test. So it's going to be a pretty long, comprehensive thing. So starting here, steel and other metals, uh, highlight where it says ferrous metals. It says, ferrous metals are those metals that have a high iron content. They include the many types of steels and its alloys, cast iron and wrought iron. Non-ferrous metals highlight that too. Uh, Non-ferrous metals are those that are almost free of iron. Non-ferrous metals include copper, lead, zinc, titanium, aluminum, nickel, tungsten, uh, manganese, brass, and bronze. And then, of course, gold, platinum, silver. Um, and they're non-magnetic. Steel, highlight steel, is a combination of iron and carbon. Iron is a pure chemical element. Uh, oxides of iron are found in nature, and iron ore is abundant throughout the world. Because iron is not strong enough and hard enough to be used in structural members, it must be combined with carbon to produce the characteristics necessary for steel to form. This would be a bullet. Up to a certain point, the more carbon steel contains, the stronger and harder the steel will be. If you get, go beyond a certain point, then you have detrimental effects. Go ahead and flip the page. Highlight this and, and uh, put a bullet by it. It says, it has been estimated that nearly 80% of all weldments are fabricated from steel and that 85% of the total amount of steel welded in the, is welded is in the mild steel classification. There's three classifications. There's low, low carbon steel, medium carbon steel, and high carbon steel. And we'll talk about those a little later in the chapter. Uh, when he's talking about uh, uh, mild steel, that's just another term for low carbon steel. Um, typically it has 0.15% carbon or less, so about 15% 15 of one penny out of 100 pennies is all the carbon it has in it, very small amounts. Um, history of steel. From about 1350 BC to 1300 AD, all the iron tools and weapons were produced directly from iron ore. Low carbon iron was first produced in relatively flat uh, hearth ovens. Uh, gradually, the furnaces were increased in height and change. Charge was introduced through the top. When they're talking about a charge, that's where they're putting, putting the, the material in. They charge them from the top and they get a bellows going uh, to create the heat. These shaft furnaces produced molten high carbon steel. Shaft furnaces were used in Europe after 1350 AD, and the modern blast furnace is a, is a shaft furnace, so that's a, that's a holdover. Over. Um, highlight this where it says, prior to the Bessemer process of making steel, only two methods were used. The cementation process increased the carbon content of wrought iron by heating it in contact with hot carbon in the presence of air and the crucible, underline that, the crucible process consisted of melting wrought iron in crucibles to which carbon had been added. Both of these processes were known and used by the ancients. Very last uh, sentence on that column, highlight this. The crucible process eventually came to be used chiefly for making special steels. The cementation process was highly developed and was also used extensively in England during the 18th and 19th centuries. The process is still used to a limited extent. The crucible process has been replaced by the various electric furnace processes for making special alloy steels and carbon, carbon tool steels. So way back, as far back as you can remember, imagine uh, they were making, they were, they were mining iron ore, and it comes in various different forms, and then they were melting it down and adding small amounts of carbon. Well, no, I take that back. They weren't adding small amounts of carbon at this time. When you add carbon, you get steel. 
but you've heard of the Iron Age. So this was the Iron Age, and they would take this stuff and melt it in crucibles, and they could tap it off, and they could actually make wrought iron stuff out of it. And we're going to get to that here in a second. So, you know, society is defined by, by the materials we use in, in, in our life. I mean, we had the Stone Age, then we had the Iron Age, and the Copper Age, and the Bronze Age, and the Age of Steel. And, and if you just look back on it, it, we're defined by our technology. Now we're in the Computer Age. So, what's next? Steel making in the United States, highlight, it, highlight it just above those bullets where it says a succession of events spurred the growth of the steel industry. They found new uses for iron, the, the discovery of large iron ore deposits in northern Michigan, the development of the Bessemer and open hearth processes, the Civil War and America's explosive industrial growth following the war, uh, the expansions of the railroads, and World Wars I and II. And there will be a question coming from those bulleted items. Currently, the largest steel producer in the world is China at 123.3 metric tons. The United States is second with 97.2 metric tons, followed by Japan. Uh, and then there are some other major producers, including Russia. There will be a question coming from that section. Drop down to the bottom of the page. It says, steel making facilities have changed greatly over the last few decades, where there used to be nearly 250 blast furnaces there are now only 36 blast furnaces for the production of iron, and no open hearth furnaces are being used. The principal reason for this reduction is the increased use of recycled steel. So at one time we had a 250 uh, blast furnaces in the United States, but because we've gotten away from that and so much steel is being recycled, they didn't need them. They shut them down. They closed them. And most of that recycled steel comes from old automobiles. Um, Next paragraph, it says, the perfection of the welding process as a means of joining metals has speeded up the, and expanded the use of steel. The adaptability of steel to manufacturing processes and its ability to join with many other metals to give a wide variety of alloys have also contributed to its widespread use. With the continued development of various welding processes, uh, the welding and cutting of aluminum, stainless steel, titanium, and other alloys have become routine production applications. I mentioned before that um, iron ore came in various forms. Over in the next column, you'll see magonite, hematite, limonite, siderite, taconite, and then jasper. There will be a question coming out of those bulleted items. Let's see. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I have a, uh, this is, you'll see, the, is, is that clear? Can everybody see that okay? Okay. This is out of your book. If you flip to page 40 now, put a bullet where it says oxygen, and it says oxygen is the most abundant element on earth. Almost half the weight of the land, 21% by weight of the air, and nearly 90% of percent by weight of the sea consists of oxygen. Page 44 is where it continues. Put a bullet on this paragraph that reads, the steel industry is a major consumer of oxygen. The gas goes into most of the standard steel mill processes from the blast furnace to the finished product. Oxygen is used in the steel making process to purify the material. Bullet. When directed into the surface of molten iron, it oxidizes the carbon, silicone, manganese, and other undesirable elements. It also speeds up the steel making process by supporting the combustion of other fuels. Let me go over this thing real quickly. This is figure 3.1 in, in your book. It's a flow chart. And what it does, it describes the manufacture of or, or the or the recovery of ores okay now it just so happens I spent four years in copper mines and I did virtually everything that you see on this board uh, I worked on a drilling crew and some of those cold nights were so cold that you had to stand in the heat given off by the exhaust of the engine just to stay warm while they were sitting out there drilling and you'd be overcome by all the gases of that exhaust fume, but it was better than freezing to death I'll tell you and we would drill down 20 feet and then just like the Oklahoma City bomber, uh, we would pump 
uh, um, fertilizer down in there and kerosene down in there, and then we would take something that looked like a baby bottle. It's about that long, it's about as big around a baby bottle, and it was full of, uh, of, a, um, of an explosive powder. And we would wrap primer cord, which, which was a percussion cord around it, and we would tie it off and we would drop it down in those holes. And we would just go along and you would, we, you would have holes every, maybe every 30 feet, the length of this room. Uh, and we'd drill down and drop some powder down in there and drop these par primer cords down in there. And we'd do an entire shelf, an entire bank drilling like this. And then we would clear the mine and uh, they would attach a blasting cap and it, then it was the force of the pressure going through all that, all that primer cord, it would, it would be under pressure, that pops it all off. And if any of you have seen them out here at the coal mines, you'll see an entire mountain go up at once. So I did that and I worked on the blasting crew and I, hauled, uh, I drove a 35 ton haulage truck while I was out there. And that's really fun when, uh, when it rains and, and that fine dust turns into snot and you're trying to go downhill. <laughs> so that's really fun. Uh, and I would drop it into a, a uh, a crusher. Well, we dropped it. We dropped it into a. It was actually a big hopper, and there was a there was a there was a an, ar an arm there that has. It was a big old jackhammer, hydraulic jackhammer, and you'd sit in sit in the control room, and I got to do this too. You sit in the control room, and you would put we called it the bull prick, and you'd come down on a rock like so, and it would just pound that rock and crush it down enough to slip it through some railroad ties, and if it slipped through the railroad ties, it would then it was the right size to go into the crusher. Well, I spent time on the crusher too, and all that was was a big bell spinning around like this, and those big rocks that we dropped into the hopper would go into this crusher, and it would crumble them up and make them into about football-sized stuff, and then it would fall on down uh, onto a, to a feeder thing and go on up and be dropped into bins, and that's where we kept the raw stuff. After that, when they needed to draw some off, it would go through a vibrating feeder, which would sit there and shake, and it would shake down these vibrating feeders and drop into a cone crusher, which would be the first process in the mill. They would crush it down a little bit more. Then it would drop, in, drop into another one and, and then go through another crusher and finally be fed into these bins, which would eventually take it down to a rod mill. And as the name implies, this was a, this was a mill that just turned around in circles like this and it had steel rods in there of various sizes to grind it up even more. Then from there, Let's see, where are we at? From there, it would go into, a, there, we had another bill. Um, I don't see it here, ball mill. That's where we would go. We'd go into a ball mill, and we would crush it up here, and then we would put it through a separator. Uh, let's see. It would go into these hydro separators here and get washed, and it would wash away an awful lot of the, the stuff that you didn't need. And the good stuff would be, would be taken off, skimmed off, and go through a, what they call a flotation recovery system. They would put various chemicals in there and percolate it, and it would float the copper oxides up to the or copper sulfides up to the top, and we would skim those off. They were kind of a silver color, and it kept kept going through all of this stuff uh, through concentrators. Uh, eventually, it would it would come all the way out here as it was processed, and 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 when it was finally done, it, it had the consistency of a thick hard mud. And this was the, the final product that we would do at the mill. And at that point, we'd be ready to ship it over to the, uh, to the smelter, where they would actually smelt it down and get the copper out of it. They'd also leach gold and other elements out of it, but it was primarily copper. So I did, I was a tailings dykeman. I worked here on the tailings. I worked on the concentrator. I worked on the ball mill. It's been four years there. And the last year I spent in the smelter, which we're going to talk about next. And that's the worst job I ever had, I want to tell you. Okay, let's go back to your book before we get to the smelter. Okay, we're on page 44 and talking about fuels. So they're going to have oxygen in, in these blast furnaces, and we'll talk about the furnaces in a second. But for a fuel, they've got to have something to, to, to run that thing, so they use coal. So I would highlight uh, right under where it says coal, right, highlight that first sentence then drop down to the last sentence in that first paragraph and says a large part of the coal is used in making coke for use in the blast furnace. About 1,300 pounds of coke are used for each ton of pig iron produced. Coke must be free, I'm reading from the next paragraph now, coke must be free from dust, the right size to permit rapid combustion strong enough to carry the charge in the blasting furnace and as free as possible from sulfur. So we'll get to coke here in a minute. Oil. Oil is used extensively in the industry, both as a fuel and as a lubricant. 
uh, highlight the part that says about 70% of the fuel oil used by the steel lunch industry is consumed but in melting iron, mostly in open hearth furnaces. furnaces. More than 20% of the industry's fuel oil is burned in heating and annealing furnaces where steel products are given special heat treatments. We'll talk about heat treatments later. Natural gas, highlight the first sentence on that. It says natural gas is burned in open hearth furnaces, furnaces and reheating furnaces and in other places where clean heat is necessary. Put a bullet by coke. You should know what coke is. Uh, coke may be defined as the solid residue obtained when coal is heated to a high temperature in the absence of air. This causes the gases and impurities to be released. Coke is a hard, brittle substance consisting chiefly of carbon, together with small amounts of hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus. So those are all the things that go into a furnace. Let's see, do we have a picture of one? We'll get to a picture of a blast furnace in just a second. Let me see. It's actually figure 3-9. Okay, that's on page 53. So we're, we're working our way there, so I'm not going to put my other uh, overhead on until we get there. So that's coke. So we'll turn to page 47 and scrap steel. Now they just said that the number of uh, furnaces were reduced to two, from 250 to 36 because of scrap steel. So highlight this paragraph or this column on scrap steel. It says the earliest methods of making steel could not make use of scrap. Today's basic oxygen furnaces, and that's a, that's a name you should remember, uh, which include early blast furnaces and electric furnaces are very capable of using scrap and nearly 66 percent of the steel currently used is recycled. Steel is generally made using a continuous caster that produces slabs, billets, and blooms. These are um, raw products, steel products that we'll talk about after a while. Um, a basic oxygen furnace may take up to 80 percent liquid metal directly from the blast furnace and then add up to 20 percent scrap metal. Uh, an integrated producer using this method can better control the, and produce higher grades of steel than a steel maker who simply melts scrap. Since steel has no memory, uh, what once was a juice can may become part of your car this year and in next year it may become part of a bridge. Blast furnaces do not use scrap except in the form of center, which is a, uh, something else that we'll talk about here af after a while. Steel mills recycle any of their own product that is not usable and they also recycle items such as packing cases. However, one of the best sources of scrap steel it comes from old automobiles. Scrap steel has become one of uh, become of such a valuable commodity that the American metal market actually tracks the price of certain types of scrap steel, just like in the commodities market, just like pork bellies and all that other stuff. They'll track it. Bullet limestone. Limestone is used as a flux in the blast furnace. Uh, drop down to the next paragraph, it says, highlight this, limestone consists largely of calcium carbonate in varying degrees of purity. Drop down to the last paragraph, that's a bullet. Limestone is one of the chief fluxes used in steel making to separate the impurities from the iron ore. Many of the impurities associated with iron ores are of a highly refractory nature. That is, they are difficult to melt. If they remain unfused, they would retard the smelting operation and interfere with the separation of metal and the impurities. The primary function of limestone is to make these substances more easily fusible. Um, and figure 3.6 shows the steps in the process. What it is, it, it, it combines and it, and it floats off all those impurities as slag. Okay? So it's a very important uh, element in, in refining steel. Uh, refractory. Everybody, well, some of you may not have heard what refract is. You know, it, it comes in brick form for for hot, high, high temperature environments. In a power plant, they'll it, they'll mix it up in a in a bucket, and it kind of looks like cement, and they'll they'll smear it on. It's highly resistant to heat, and that's what refract is. So let's, yeah, that's that that's the that's the abbreviation name for it is refract. 
Refractory materials may be defined as non-metallic materials that can tolerate severe or destructive service conditions at high temperatures. They must withstand chemical attack, uh, molten metal, and slag. And now we need to go to page 49. Uh, erosion, thermal shock, physical impact, catalytic actions, pressure under load and soaking heat, and other rigorous abuse. Melting or softening temperatures of most refractory materials range from 2,600 degrees for light duty uh, fire clay to 5,000 for bricks made of magnesia in its purest form. So there's a bunch of different varieties. You should understand what refract is. Um, next topic is iron blast furnace slag. Uh, highlight this slag you should know what slag is slag is the residue produced from the interaction of the molten limestone and the impurities of the iron it contains the oxides of calcium silicone aluminum and magnesium small amounts of iron oxide and sulfur slag may be processed for use in the manufacture of cement and concrete uh, road materials insulating roofing material and soil conditioners so they do have a byproduct use for it um, I mentioned before that I worked in a smelter after I spent a few years in the copper mine and they had mountains of slag and the way they did it well let me sh let me show you here well this isn't really this isn't really very clear of what I want to talk about but what they would do is they would tap they would tap the furnace and bring out this copper after they melted it they pour it into a big ladle and then a big sky crane would come over and pick it up and take it over and they would refine it they would put these, these, uh, these air lances into the bottom of the furnace and blow oxygen into it because that causes oxidation and all those impurities to, to float up and it really gets the temperature up there. Then they would skim off the unwanted slag and they would tip these things and you'll see about them, you'll read about them in your book. You talk about hot, noisy, smoky, terrible stuff. So they would skim off the slag and one of my first jobs in the smelter was to clean the recovery chutes for these, this slag because they were constantly dumping in the slag back into the furnace to see if they could get more <coughs> copper out of it. So they'd pick these big old buckets up, bring them over, and they'd, they'd, they'd tip them by crane into a chute that was about this wide, and it ran maybe 20 feet back down into the furnace. Well, my job was to stand there with a pry bar, big old, big old bar, and everybody knows what one of those are. They're, they're about this tall, and they probably weigh 30 pounds, and you've got to sit there, and you have to hit the side of the chute to break off all the slag that adhered to the chute from being poured back in. He had to do that after every ladle. He had to wear a mask and earplugs and hard hat and all that stuff. And every time they would open up that door to dump it back in, you'd get the heat of the blast furnace coming out of there. And we're talking about sulfur smoke. Sulfur smoke. And I was so overcome with it that they finally took me off because you just can't, you just can't work in that environment for very long. I spent about a month on that and that, I was ready to quit and they, they brought in somebody else and had them do it. But it was very difficult to stay up with. Uh, they would pour that slag back in there. You'd have to jump down, chip all that stuff off, push it back down. If they, push it down into the, uh, the furnace with a broom, or they had a metal thing that you would push it back down in. And then you had to take uh, lime in a bucket, a bucket of water with lime mixed in, and you had to push it or uh, rather throw it down into this into this trough to coat it so that it wouldn't stick so bad. And if you missed once, if you got too tired and had to take a break, and they put two ladles in there, forget it. It was just tougher than hell. To, to do that. So, uh, moral of the story is don't ever work in a smelter unless you have to. So that's my relationship with slag. I'm, you, you guys know, know it from your welding. I know it from the, from the steel or copper making process. Okay, carbon. Uh, carbon is a non-metallic element that can form a great variety of compounds with other elements. Compounds containing ca uh, carbon are called organic compounds. In union with oxygen, carbon forms carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. When carbon combines with a metal, it may form carb uh, compounds such as calcium carbide and iron carbide. Uh, those are not necessarily good things in the welding industry. Um, this is interesting. I want to point this out to you. It says, three forms of pure carbon exist. The diamond is pure carbon in the crystalline form. Uh, graphite is a soft form, I'm, we're turning on page, to page 52, and then carbon black is the amorphous form, uh, meaning it doesn't have any structure. Uh, and they use carbon black uh, as, as toner in, in uh, copy machines 
or, or in conveyor belts, in paints, um, and in tires. So there's a lot of uses for that type of a carbon. It says, in addition to being important as an ingredient in st of steel, carbon is used for, an industri for industrial diamonds and abrasives and arc carbons of all kinds. As graphite, it forms a base of lubricants and is used as a lining in for blast furnaces. Okay, now the smelting of, fi uh, of iron, which brings us to this. This is a basic blast furnace, and they'll, they'll charge it by sending stuff up here to the top, and dropping it in, and they'll melt it down in here. And then uh, you can see from this thing that they'll tap off the slag here, and then they'll tap off the, the iron here. And the slag, it, it's hard to tell from this picture, but the slag outlet is slightly higher than the outlet for the steel because the slag is going to float to the top and then they'll tap it off. And in the situation I worked in, they, and, and they talk about them in here, the same kind of an operation, they would actually tilt, tilt these things and pour the slag off, just skim it off that way. And then they'll draw off hot metal here, uh, iron at 2700 degrees, and then they would go ahead and they would cast it into, into ingots or billets or blooms and stuff like that. In the case of the copper, they would pour them into ladles that were a little wider than this table and about four feet long and they had ears on them. They looked like this. And they were about four inches thick and they put these ears on there so that they could pick them up and, and move them around like that. And they had, they had little jigs that they could pick them up and move them around. Weighed an awful lot. Um, and those molds had to be, had to be uh, painted with with lime and stuff so it wouldn't stick to the molds and everything. Um, and if the mold didn't come out right, they would go ahead and they would drop that back into the furnace and melt it down again. Drop it back in and heat it up and melt it down. So it's a really interesting process but a very hot, noisy, nasty one. Okay, this is a bullet. There's going to be a question. The first step in the conversion of iron ore into steel takes place in the blast furnace. In this towering cylindrical structure, iron is fed in from most of the impurities associated with it in the ore. Uh, drop down to the middle of that next paragraph, it says, this is a continuous process. As a new charge is introduced at the top, the liquid iron and slag are removed at the bottom. So they're charging it at the top continuously and, and pulling out the slag and the iron down here at the bottom. Uh, next paragraph, highlight this. The liquid iron is poured into molds to form what is known as pigs of iron. Pig iron, that's a bullet. Uh, drop down to the next paragraph. Nearly all of the pig iron produced in blast furnaces remains in the molten state and is loaded directly into steel making furnaces. A small amount is solidified and transported to iron foundries that remelt it. Then the iron is cast into a wide variety of products ranged from toys to cylinder heads for automobile engines. Okay. Next page it says. Uh, second column, the number of blast furnaces in the United States has declined over the past 30 years, but the total annual pig iron production has increased greatly. Enlarged furnaces, refined and controlled raw materials, and much higher blast furnace temperatures are responsible for the increase in production. Okay, so now we know they, how they dig it out of the ground, they take it over here and they melt, melt it, and now we have the raw material of iron. Now they're going to make... Uh, make steel. Cementation process. Earlier we talked about the cementation process and the crucible process. Both of those have been around forever. Read the first paragraph on each of those so you'll understand that a little more clearly. Uh, electric furnaces process. Know, that, know these two types. Uh, the electric arc type and the induction furnace. Flip the page says uh, electricity is used solely for the production of heat and does not impart any properties to the steel. Well, I guess I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. What they do is they, they have three electrodes ranging from 4 to 24 inches in diameter. Let me see. Look at fig, figure 312. It's on the next page. I should have made an overlay of this and I didn't. I apologize for that. If you look down here at this bottom picture, these three probes coming down carry electricity. They lower these down into the steel and they, they heat the steel up through these electric probes. Uh, and, and they range in diameter from 4 to 24 inches and they melt the steel through electricity. They produce a direct arc with three-phase power and are supplied with electric current through a transformer. 
The electrodes enter the furnace through the roof. The roof is removable and can be swung aside to charge the furnace. The charge consists almost entirely of scrap with small amounts of burned lime and mill scale. The furnaces are circular and can be tilted to tip the molten metal into a steel ladle. So the electric induction furnace is the other kind. Uh, it is essentially a transformer with the molten metal acting as the core. It consists of a crucible, usually made of magnesia, surrounded by a layer of tamped in magnesia refrac. Around this is a coil made of copper tubing forming the primary winding that is connected to the current source. The coil is encased in a heavy box with silica brick bottom lining. A lip is built into the box to allow the metal contents to run forward uh, whenever it's tilted. So really, what I want you to know about that is that there are two types, uh, the electric arc type and the induction furnace type. Okay. Oxygen process, this is another type of smelting. The lens don don waltz, donal wits. The lens donal wits process is a method of pig iron and scrap conversion whereby oxygen is injected downward over a bath of metal. Um, let's see. In the next column, I highlight the paragraph that reads. The chemical reaction of the oxygen and flux fluxes refine the pig iron and the scrap into steel. The temperature reaches 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit and refining continues for 20 to 25 minutes. When the refining is complete, the lance is withdrawn. The furnace is tilted and the steel is tapped through a hole in the side near the top. The slag is also removed and the furnace is ready for another charge. And that is on page 63 and 64. You can see how they did that. Vacuum furnaces, degassing equipment. Um, there is going to be a question on degassing. So highlight this, it says this, the melting of steel and other alloys in a vacuum reduces the gases in the metal and produces metal with a minimum of impurities. The gases formed in a vacuum furnace are pulled out by the metal, uh, out of the metal by vacuum pumps. They do this to get really, really pure stuff. So it's entirely enclosed in a vacuum so that no oxygen or anything else that they don't want to go in there will go in there. And then they, they draw off all those gases through these vacuum pumps and it's an entirely closed, closed system so that they can control minutely whatever goes, goes into that steel. If you look on page 65, upper right hand, hand column says vacuum processing of steel. It says, steels for special applications are often processed in a vacuum to give them properties not otherwise attainable. And I wanted to bring this to your attention because it's really a, a unique uh, and highly, highly desirable process to get those, those exotic steels that they have to have. That's stuff they have to have that's just got a certain amount of, of titanium in them or a certain amount of copper. I mean, it's really a neat process. The primary purpose of vacuum processing is to remove such gases as oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen from the molten metal to make higher purity steel. Uh, the next one down that says the vacuum degassers. I highlighted from uh, about half that paragraph that starts the conventional melted steel goes into a pony ladle and from there into the chamber. The ste uh, stream of steel is broken up into droplets when it is exposed to the vacuum within the chamber. During the droplet phase, undesirable gases escape from the steel and are, and are drawn off before the metal solidifies in the mold. So they actually put it in and they basically sprinkle it down in, into this thing and it's as they're falling in the form of droplets that it's releasing all these undesirable gases and then those undesirable gases are drawn off. Then finally I highlighted the last paragraph at the bottom, bottom here that says ladle degassing facilities shown to the right of several kinds are in current use. In the left hand facility uh, molten steel is forced by atmospheric pressure into the heated vacuum chamber. Gases are removed in the pressure in this pressure chamber, when it, which is then raised so that the molten steel returns by gravity into the ladle. Since not all the steel enters the vacuum chamber at one time, this process is repeated until essentially all the steel in the ladle has been processed. So that's a couple of different ways that they do it. Questions on that? Okay, look at page 69. Continuing, continuous casting of steel. So 
So we went through the, we, we dug it out of the ground, we refined it in the mill, we sent it to the furnace, we smelted it down, and we've got the steel now. So what are we going to do with it? We're going to make products out of it. And they use the continuous casting process. So there's going to be a question on this part right here. So I would put a bullet and highlight it. It says continuous casting is the process by which molten steel is solidified into semi-finished billets, booms, or slabs uh, for subsequent finishing. Flip the page and it says, highlight the last paragraph on that topic. It says, depending on the product in use, various shapes are cast. The trend is to have the melting, casting, and rolling processes linked so that the casting shape substantially conforms to the finished product. The near net shape cast section is most commonly used for beams and flat rolled products and greatly improves operational efficiency. The complete operation from liquid metal to finished rolling can be achieved within a couple of hours. Okay, it says how continuous casting works. For, for what we're concerned with, you don't have to, have to read that. I mean, you can if you want to, to get an understanding of it. Uh, but what I really want you to know is that this is used to make all of these products up here. So it comes out of, uh, sometimes they use an ingot in the form of blooms and such, or they'll use the continuing casting, continuous casting process, and they'll make billets and slabs. So they can produce all of these, all of these different things. And then if they, they can do cold drawn bars, wire, and if they do wire, they just send it through a series of different dies and get, it, get the diameter smaller and smaller and smaller until they get what they want. They can make uh, tube rounds or a seamless pipe, uh, structural shapes like uh, um, I-beams or rails for, for railroad car uh, tracks. You can get hot rolled sheet and strip, cold rolled. These are where all these terms come from. You, I'm sure you've all heard of cold rolled. So you get, you get those, you get 10 products, welded pipe and tubing, and welded pipe's another thing we'll talk about sometime, uh, plates, and then large diameter pipes, and most of that's done through the continuous casting process. So flip to page 75, metalworking. After steel has been cast into ingot molds and solidified, it may be put through one or more of several metal working processes to shape it and further improve its characteristics. Forging and rolling serve two fundamental purposes. Uh, they serve the purely mechanical purpose of getting the steel into the desired shape and they improve the mechanical properties by destroying the cast structure. Uh, we're going to talk about structure here in just a minute. Whenever they pour this stuff, um, when metal solidifies, it, it, it takes on a crystalline structure, and there's a variety of different, different crystalline structures that we'll talk about. And they're not always uniformly aligned, I guess you could say. And so through, through forging and casting, they can change that alignment. Uh, let's see. This breaking up of the cast structure, also called orienting the grain, is important chiefly in that it makes the steel stronger, more ductile, and gives it a greater shock resistance. Okay, I want you to read about drop uh, forging and know uh, the definition of, of drop forging on this page, so that'll be a bullet. Flip the page and we're going to talk about rolling. These are different ways that they use uh, use steel, use these blooms and billets. So there'll be a question on, on what is a bloom, what is a billet, what is a slab? That'll be a question. In reading, uh, I've highlighted this entire column, this entire column uh, on page uh, 76. Read about that, read about hot, cold, and rolled, cold rolled. Read about black iron, this is a bullet. Uh, Tubular steel products are classified according to two principal methods of manufacture, the welded and seamless methods. Welded tubing and pipe are made by flash welding, steel strips. In the process, the metal pieces are heated until the contacting surfaces are in the plastic state and then forced together quickly under pressure. We'll talk about plasticity here in a little bit. Seamless tubing or pipe is made from billets by two processes known as piercing and cupping. In piercing, a heated steel bar is pierced by a mandrel and rolled to the desired diameter and wall thickness. And in the cupping process, 
heated plate is formed around a cup shaped die. Uh, I've got one, two, three, three bullets on, the, on that column. So it's very probable that I'll bring three questions to bear out of that. Another way of doing, uh, doing welded pipe, you don't often see it, but sometimes it happens. They'll take, especially if it's larger diameter pipe, they'll have a seam right here, and they'll actually use the TIG process, automatic TIG process, inside and outside and they'll they'll set up two two TIG machines, automatic TIG machines and one, I think it's the top one, leads the bottom one and they'll actually weld this stuff inside and outside and they'll roll them, walk them into a length of pipe that they've formed. The, they, they've turned it into a shape, a round shape, and this is usually with bigger stuff and then they go ahead and they, and they walk these two probes down the length of this pipe. And that's great as long as you you know that they're lined up properly because what happens with it sometimes is you have it like this and and the, the, the pipe comes together right here but if the probes wander a little bit you might be off there and you might be off there and so it's it's caught enough that if they pressure test this stuff and that's the way they check it they pressure test it that's all they're required to do under the code they'll pressure test it but because they caught the seam at the bottom and they caught the seam at the top it holds pressure. Okay, good pipe, ship it out. Until it gets out there in the field and they put it under vibratory stress because they've cut it up now and they've used it in various things and then this cracks and then suddenly it's leaking. So they don't realize this uh, discontinuity or defect is there until it's actually put into service. So you gotta kinda pay attention to what process did they use to manufacture your pipe. Uh, is, it, and is it seamless or if it is welded pipe how did they how did they do that weld? How did they make that weld? Okay, so that's rolling. Um, pardon me. One other thing I want to talk about. And this will bring us to our first slide. Rolling directions. We're going to pick this up. Uh, at the bottom of that first column, again, where I'm still on 76, where it says steel may be also shaped into wire, bars, forgings, extrusions, rails, and structured shapes. These are the basic steel shapes from which the welded fabrication begins. Uh, in the w rolling operation, the grains are oriented in the direction of rolling, just like a piece of wood. Steel has more strength with the grain, less strength across the grain, and even less uh, through the grain. Um, if you look over on the next page, it says figure 332 describes this situation. And this, this uh, uh, slide is that same figure. That's slightly different because it's a different source, but that's basically the same figure. And if you look at this, you have an X, Y, and Z direction. And this, this really came home to roost one time when I conducted some well tests. I went up to a place in Montana. I was going to certify for some of their welders and the company had all the material ready for me when I got there. Okay, So we, we did some tests, they made the welds, and we started bending them, and they all failed. And these were good, good welds, they looked great. They couldn't figure out why, why it failed. And I said, well, are you sure that you had the, the correct direction of rolling on those plates? And they said, what? What are you talking about? And that's because you get about 70% of your, of your strength this way, 30% this way, and only about 15% that way. Well, let's see. Here we go. The X direction, this way, is your best strength and ductility. The Y direction across is 10 to 30% less, uh, and 20 to 50% less ductility. And then this way, there's virtually none. So if you look at that figure, and what they had done was they had cut it this way. They had cut their coupons this way. They, they, they just split a bar this way, lengthwise. And then we made the welds in there, and there was no, there's no ductility or strength, and they failed. So once we, you know, I had them recut everything, and gosh, it, it all worked. They all passed after that. So direction of rolling. When you hear that term, and you, might, you may hear it a lot in your welding careers, direction of rolling, it's very important for the mechanical properties of plate, okay? Whether it's a 4 by 8 sheet or, or a quarter inch by 1 inch backing strip, direction of rolling is very important. There will be a question on that. 
Okay. Read about drawing, extrusion, no questions on those. Uh, this is my directional property, my other slide on directional properties. Both strength and ductility are affected by the rolling direction of the metal. The three axes of, of the rolling directions are referred to as the X, Y, and Z. Um, X is length, Y is transverse, and Z is the through thickness. Heat treatment. There's a variety of heat treatments. Um, but typically, they're going to be defined as, as supercritical or subcritical. And that, where's my pointer? That depends on how high you raise the temperature. This is something you need to remember. And we'll see it in the book in a minute. 1,333 degrees. This is called the transformation range. This is the lower transformation range. When you heat a, heat a metal above 1,333 degrees, you're going to change its, its structure. Uh, you're going to go from a, from a ferrite, cementite structure to an austenite structure. Uh, there's, there's five primary grain structures that we'll talk about. But if you want to change them, if you go above this, this, this temperature, that's where they go to do annealing, normalizing, and quenching, you can see it's above the transformation range. The subcritical one, where you get close to that but you don't actually change the structure, is used for tempering and stress relieving. Okay? Um, so let me read this where it says heat treatment. Heat treatment is the process of heating and cooling a material, a, pardon me, a metal, for the purpose of improving its structural or physical properties. Through various processes of heat treatment, we can make a metal easier to machine, draw, or form by making it softer, or we can increase the hardness so that it will have wear resistance. Uh, the important variables in any heat treatment process are the carbon content, the temperature of heating, the time allowed for cooling, and the cooling medium. Now, there, there would be a question based on that last part right there, those four items. Hardening. Hardening is a process in which steel is heated above its critical point. What's the critical point? 1333. And then cooled rapidly. The critical point is the point at which the carbon, which is the chief hardening agent, changes the structure of the steel. Uh, this produces a hardness that is superior to that of the steel before heating and cooling. Only medium, light, and very high carbon steels can be treated in this manner. Case hardening. Here I only want you to know the various types, there's cyaniding, carburizing, nitriding, and flame hardening. Now, as the name implies, case hardening, if you had a block of steel, and you're going to do case hardening, you're basically just going to harden the outside edge. And that's what all of these processes are designed to do. Um, down to, it's measured in thousandths of an inch. I mean, it's just not very hard at all. That way you retain some of the ductility and other mechanical properties in the body of the material, but you've increased its wear resistance on the outside. So know those four terms. There'll probably be a question in which I'll ask you something to the effect of uh, name two different case hardening techniques, something, something to that effect. Okay, annealing. I don't know if I have anything annealing. Let's see here. No, nope, don't have anything on annealing, so we'll catch up here in a second. So let me read about annealing. So what does annealing do? Remember, you raise a, to, to anneal, you go above 1333. So they use annealing to remove stresses, to induce softness for better machining properties, to alter ductility, toughness, or electromagnetic or physical, other pro physical properties, to refine the crystalline structure, to produce a definite microstructure. Uh, the changes that take place in a metal depend on the annealing temperature the rate of cooling, and the carbon content. There's that carbon content again. Carbon has the greatest effect on, on iron of any element in existence. Most important one. Another form of annealing is stress relief annealing. It is usually applied only in, to low carbon steels. The purpose here is to relieve the stress caused by working of the steel, such as in welding. The material is heated to a, a point just under, just below the critical range, and allowed to cool normally. 
Uh, it is important to note here that the differences between hardening and softening of steels is due to the rate of cooling. Fast cooling hardens, slow cooling softens. Um, well, let's try this. This is a grain structure, okay? And it's basically going to be ferrite, uh, cementite, and perlite. These are some of the different types of grains. If you heat it above 1333, now you're going to change this structure into austenite. Now, if you, if you cool it slowly, it's going to change back to this. So just go up, come back down. So you can jump between the two. If you go fast, then you're going to change it to martensite, which is a different structure. Martensite is very, very hard, very, very strong, but very, very brittle. They use it for wear resistant stuff. Uh, and those are, the, those are the primary ones. Uh, Now to get to here, you're basically quenching it. This is why if you take your, if you weld something and you throw it in the water real quick, it's going to change from, from, from the austenite range to the martensite range because you've cooled, cooled it too fast. And that's why you can see that sometimes it'll snap for no apparent reason. You look at it while the metal's all nice and clean. Well, you just cooled it too fast. But if you slow cool it, then it will change to what's called bainite. And again, we're going up above this, this critical range of 1333, and then we're slow cooling it here. So how fast you come down is, is, is very important. Um, then there's, there's one more, it's called, I should have put this over here a little bit different, it's called tempered martensite. And it's, it's still martensite, but you raise it up to where it's just beneath 1333, which would be up here. And you raise it up to where it's just beneath that, that temperature. And it, and it changes some of that, depending on how long you hold it. And it, you'll change the structure back to perlite. And so it gives it some better properties of ductility and stuff. So you can see from this jumble here that, that they have a whole bunch of ways to, to work with steel. Um, either above or below the, the critical range in order to get the types of properties that they want. That's one element. The other is what's going into it. Carbon. Carbon has the greatest effect. But they also put in uh, nickel and chrome. Um, just all kinds of stuff. Pardon me, chrome. Uh, depending on what they want. And that's what, that's what basically what this chapter is about. Especially as it relates to stainless steels. So, no, read about annealing, know what annealing is, and know that the cooling rate is what's very important. So you're going to raise it up, you're going to hold it for a time, and you're going to cool it. How, how long you hold it makes, makes differences. How quickly you bring it down makes differences. Tempering, I just talked about tempering here. Tempering is the process wherein the hardness of a steel is reduced after heat treating. It is also used to relieve stresses and strains caused by quenching. Uh, that would be our quenched martensite. This is usually done by heating the hardened steel to some predetermined temperature between room temperature and the critical temperature, holding it at that temperature for a length of time, and then cooling it in air or water. The reduction of hardness depends upon the following three factors. Uh, tempering temperature, the amount of time the steel is held at this temperature, and the carbon content of the steel. Uh, generally, as the temperature and time are increased, the hardness will uh, be decreased. Uh, and this is a bullet. The higher the carbon content at a given temperature and time, the higher the resulting hardness. They also have a, a technique that you may have to use sometime in your welding. And it's called a, temper, a tempered bead sequence. And this is actually Tempering, you know, changes the, it's, it's kind of a stress relieving thing and it changes the properties of the steel and such. But this is actually something that's approved by ASME, the American Society of Me Mechanical Engineers. 
if you had to make a weld, say you got to put a, put a tube down in here and this stuff is really thick and all that. And this, this stuff is some exotic material like, uh, let's say, F22, which would be a forging. It's, it's usually pretty thick, like three inches thick or so. Well, that's going to have to, you're going to have to take special heat, heat treating precautions with that so that whatever you put in here doesn't crack. Well, you can't cut that whole thing out because that would be way too expensive and you've got to get it back online, you've got to get back in service. So what you do is you, you use a rosebud or heating coils and you, and you heat this area all up and then you go ahead and, and you put a bead in, you butter here, you butter this thing, and you butter and butter and butter, and then you, you have a bead sequence where each bead, subsequent bead that you put in raises the temperature of the previous bead, thereby tempering it, you see? And so you would do it in layers, and each bead, subsequent bead, would temper the one before it stress relieving it and changing its mechanical properties. So this is actually a process that you can use that is recognized by ASME uh, as acceptable uh, to help avoid the cost and expense of trying to, to redo all of this stuff. Normalizing. When you take your test, you're going to have to know the difference between annealing, tempering, and normalizing. So uh, read about normalizing and pull a bu bullet by the last paragraph here that says, normalizing requires a faster rate of cooling than that employed by, for annealing, and it results in a harder, stronger metal uh, than that which is obtained by annealing. Okay, metal structures. How are we doing on time? I'm going to try to keep this down below an hour so nobody will fall asleep on me. Go to the next, uh, next page. It says, in order to understand the metallurgical properties of metals, it is important to have an understanding of atomic structure and the various states of matter. Four states of matter, solids, liquid, gases, and plasma. These four states of matter must be dealt with each time a piece of metal is welded or thermally cut. Know the four states of matter. The atomic arrangements that make up these four states of matter are so small they cannot be seen, even with the most powerful microscopes. Inside these extremely small atoms, there are subatomic particles, including electrons, which carry a negative charge, and protons, which carry a positive charge. The attracting and repelling forces of these uh, particles affect the properties of the metal. For example, a solid steel, uh, a solid such as a steel, has an atomic structure such that when a process attempts to force the atoms closer together, a strong repulsive force action uh, counteracts the compressive forces. If, on the other hand, a force attempts to pull the atoms further and further apart, a strong attractive action counteracts the tensile forces. The atoms try to maintain a home position, bullet, home position, even though they are constantly in a state of vibration. Everything in, in our universe is made up of, out of atoms. Uh, this table, this board, me, you, everything, the air we breathe, the water we drink, all made up of atoms. And atoms have a home position. That's how we have the structure of our universe. In a steel, as you add heat, uh, these atoms that are constantly vibrating, they're in a constant, constant motion, they begin to vibrate more, and they bump into the atoms next to them. And that atom's going to bump into the one next to it, and that one's going to bump into the one next to it. And this is how we get thermal expansion. This is why a piece of steel grows on you whenever you're welding on it or whenever you're dumping heat into it. So it's important to understand how those atoms work. You're dumping, you're giving them energy, they're becoming more agitated, they're, they're increasing their orbits, they're bouncing around even more, until finally those bonds, those attractive bonds your books talk, talk about, they finally break. And at that point it becomes a liquid. If you continue to, to dump heat into there, then it's going to vaporize and it, be, and it becomes a vapor. And if you continue to dump even more heat in there, then it's going to become a plasma, the fourth state of matter. And that's talked about here in your book. Drop down uh, to the middle of that next paragraph. It says, if the temperature is increased still further, the vaporization temperature will be reached and the liquid will turn into a gas. If the gas is superheated, it will ionize and become a plasma. Gas plasma is simply a gas that has become an electrical conductor. This form of plasma occurs in the welding arc and thus this name is applied to such processes as plasma arc cutting and plasma arc welding. 
Uh, solids, solid metals take on a three-dimensional crystalline structure uh, because the atoms align themselves into orderly layers, lines, and rows. Looking at the broken surfaces of metal or weld, this crystalline structure is quite evident. The metal has not been crystallized because it is old or has been overheated, but because all the metals are crystalline in nature. If somebody, if you know somebody that's ever failed a weld test and you look at it and it's all nice and shiny and you can see the little crystals, you go, oh, well, that, it crystallized on you. Well, of course it did. It, it, it's a crystalline structure. That's the shape that crystals, that, that the metal takes when it solidifies. Just the same as a, same as a nice crystal. So there's no such thing as failing a test because your metal crystallized. No such thing. That's a myth. So don't let anybody tell you that, that that's what happened. Um, solids. Solids have, have a minimum amount of internal en energy, so like our bar of steel. Atoms are fixed in their place, but they have a home position. They're constantly vibrating. They have orbiting electrons around them, and they take on a crystalline structure. I don't think you'll find this in your book. A lot of the slides, well, in fact, all these slides I'm using come from welding inspection technology. So those of you that go on to finally take that class, um, you're going to get a double dose of this stuff, and we'll go into it a lot more deeply than I'm going to go into it right now. Liquids have a higher internal energy. The atoms are free to move. The atoms are vibrating more. You, uh, they still have orbiting electrons, but they have no fixed structure. Amorphous. They have an amorphous structure. Now, atoms take on a variety of shapes. Remember, they're, they're crystals, and they take on various shapes. BCC, body-centered cubic, that's our iron. And what you have is you have, a, you have an atom, and then one out here, 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 one out here. So that's in the center. And so forth. Uh, this is in your book. Body-centered cubic, face-centered cubic. In a face-centered, it it's like, a, it's like the, the five dots on a set of dice. Face-centered cubic. Um, Hexagon, close pack, that's not one, that would be uh, uh, zinc and such. We're not interested in messing with those right now. Same with body center tetragonal. We're not interested in messing with those. The two you need to remember are BCC and FCC. Those are the two that we're going to deal with right now. Um, reading from your book, it says the most common phases or crystalline structures of metals are body centered cubic, face centered cubic, body centered tetragonal, and hexagon close packed. These crystal structures can be represented in figure 36, blah, 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 table 3. And I think this is pretty much what, what you have in your book. These are the different common, common structures. Face-centered, uh, body-centered, uh, cubic. This is, this is iron and steel right here. This is the one that we're mostly going to be interested in. Um, Microstructures, metals are composed of grains or crystals. They're very small, separated by grain boundaries, and there are different phases within the grains. This is something I threw in just to show you. This is the microstructure of iron, and all of these are grain boundaries that you see in here. So these are all crystals that were formed by, by iron atoms, and the way they do that, it's like... It's like... Um, the, the metal is liquid, of course. Now, as it solidifies, and we'll get into this in a minute, it's going to solidify from the cold surface in. And what you'll have is you'll have an atom here, and then an atom here, and, 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 and they, they attract one another, and they start forming a little cluster. And then you might have another cluster form over here. So you get different clusters, but, but they're not aligned. And so they'll they'll come together at this angle. Or, and then you might have another one coming in here. And so it's, it's along these places where they're not aligned that you get these grain boundaries. So the, they're going to grow from, from the outside in as, as that solidifies, and they're going to create grain boundaries as they go. Uh, grain size, down at the bottom of your, of your page, know this. Grain sizes. There will be questions on it. Fine grain metals have good tensile strength, good ductility, good low temperature properties. Coarse grain metals have slightly lower strength, slightly less ductility, 
and good high temperature properties. Um, for the most part, uh, we're going to prefer a fine grain structure. They ha uh, same thing here, grain size, fine grain materials have good tensile strength, good ductility, good low temperature properties. Coarse grain materials, slightly lower strength, slightly less ductile, have good high temperature properties. Uh, and then that brings us to alloying. Uh, before I go to alloying, let me read from your book here. It says, uh, welding has a marked effect on grain size depending on such factors as heat input, cooling rate, longer short arc, slower fast travel speed, welding, uh, welding on the high or low end of the parameter of the ranges of the process selected. Uh, uh, another method affecting mechanical properties is alloying. Okay, alloying. Uh, this is our definition. Adding elements to change mechanical or physical properties. And your book doesn't really define it. It says uh, this changes are these this changes the orderly rows, lines, and layers of three-dimensional crystal and structures and pure, that pure metal would take. Uh, I shouldn't have put that one in there. Chemical properties. Metals are, are mixtures of elements and are referred to as alloys. Minor changes in alloy composition can have major effects on alloy properties. There's two types of alloying. Uh, again, I'm probably out of, out of place here. Uh, these are some of the alloying elements. Uh, carbon percentage, ingot iron has 0.03%. Uh, Low carbon has, we, we talked about this earlier, 0.15%. Mild steel, 0.15 to, to uh, 30. Medium steel. These weren't quite, in, quite where I needed them to be in, in terms of order. Here's what I was, was getting to, interstitial alloying. Uh, carbon atoms are smaller than iron atoms, and so they will nestle between these. And because you have a, because we have that body-centered cubic, you know, if you look at it, it's going to look like that. But if you, imagine you took this and you laid it down. You got one, two, three, four. And these are your atoms. They're just like so. Then that one's going to be nestled in between there. You can think of it as oranges being packed in a crate. I mean, you got a little crate and you fill the whole bottom with oranges and then you take a plum. Put it right where all those oranges come together. That would be this atom. And then you stack more of them on top. And you get, you get your next layer. And then more, more little plums. And this is how they, this is how they grow together. And, and that's where, where these interstitial stuff is, is, is taking place. But they all have... They all have uh, uh, effects on the surrounding atoms. So you can see how they have distorted the lattice a little bit in here. So that's interstitial. Now substitutional, now in, this time in, in substitutional you've got a, a different kind of an atom, like a chromium. Say, so you have chromium. Well, chromium's too big, so it's got to replace an iron atom. So now instead of, instead of having nice neat layers, you've got orange, 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 but then up here you got apple. So apple took its place. And then orange, orange, apple, orange, orange, and so forth. And so it builds a different structure. So it replaces those oranges. Uh, so this is how you can think about uh, substitutional and interstitial alloying. And again, you can see that they have, they have a drastic effect on the surrounding structure of the crystal. That's where the mechanical properties come from. And again, always remember that carbon has the greatest effect on steel. Without carbon, we wouldn't have steel we would have iron, not steel. It is carbon that makes steel. Um, put a bullet by interstitial alloying and substitutional alloying. You must know what those terms mean. Uh, this is on page 82. Top of the second column. Okay, as I mentioned, this is in your book, as I mentioned earlier, uh, whenever you make a weld, the crystals grow from the cold wall towards the center, like so, until you have complete solidification. Um, later on, any of you that take, take the inspection class will, will learn what happens if this stuff all cools and this doesn't and this, this here cools too, uh, doesn't cool quickly enough. If this is still liquid and all of this out here is solidified, what happens to the center of that? It's something, it's something that we'll deal with in, it's a defect, and it's something that we'll deal with in, in the inspection class. 
Okay, let's see where we're at here. Okay, properties related to energy, melting point, know the melting point of steel. Weldability, weldability is the capacity of a metal substance to form a strong bond of adherence while under pressure or during solidification from, liquid, from its liquid form. Adherence is just where it's, it's a dairy, but it hasn't fused with it. It's stuck there, that's adherence, okay? Fusibility. Fusibility is the ease with which a metal can be, may be melted. In general, soft metals are easily fusible, whereas harder metals melt at higher temperatures. And it gives some examples there. Next page, volatility. Volatility is the ease with which a substance may be vaporized. A metal which has a low melting point is more volatile than a metal with a high melting point. Electrical conductivity. The electrical conductivity of a substance is the ability of the substance to conduct electrical current. Electrical resistance is just the opposite to that, and it's measured in ohms. Bullet thermal conductivity. The thermal conductivity of a substance is the ability of the substance to carry heat. Know what thermal conductivity is. And know, too, that, uh, that metals have different rates of thermal conductivity. They're not all the same. Aluminum heats a lot faster than iron. Coefficient of thermal expansion. Uh, I talked about how if you dumped heat into a, to a piece of steel, the atoms are going to vibrate more and it's going to make that grow. This is our coefficient of thermal expansion. Know what that is. That's a bullet. Coefficient of thermal expansion is the amount of expansion the metal undergoes when it is heated and the amount of contraction that occurs when it is cooled. The increase in the length of a bar one inch long when its temperature is raised one degree Celsius is called the linear coefficient of thermal expansion. The higher the coefficient, the greater amount of expansion, and therefore the greater contraction upon cooling. Expansion and contraction will be discussed in more detail later on. Hot shortness. Uh, hot shortness is the brittleness in metal when hot. This characteristic should be kept in mind in the handling of hot metals and in the jig construction and clamping. I'm not going to ask you a question on that, but uh, there's also hot shortness associated with aluminum and copper. If you've ever welded aluminum, you'll be welding along, and, and, and if you get it too hot, suddenly it'll just fall out on you. It's lost its structure. Uh, and that's basically the same thing here, but it, it doesn't give you any forewarning. It doesn't change color. It doesn't liquefy more. It's just suddenly gone. And that's hot shortness in aluminum. Same thing happens in copper. So it's a related property uh, because it loses its, it loses its structure. Uh, and here they're calling it brittleness. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a little bit different than, than uh, hot shortness in steel. Overheating is a bullet. A metal is said to be overheated when the temperature exceeds its critical range. That is, it is heated to such a degree that its properties are impaired. In some, insta some instances, it is possible to destroy the original properties of the metal through heat treatment to restore them. Pardon me. If the metal does not uh, respond to further heat treatment, it is considered to be burned underline burned and cannot meet the requirements of a heavy load. In arc welding, excess welding current or too low a, a travel speed may cause overheating in the weld deposit. This is why uh, if you have ever worked with uh, welding procedures, they'll list a maximum interpass temperature. And if you go above that, you could burn the steel. You could, you could drastically alter its mechanical properties. Uh, and remember that heat input, this is why they mention, mention amperages and, and travel speed, because heat input is a combination of those two factors, how fast you're welding and what your amperage is set at. Okay. Density. Let's see. Here at the bottom it says uh, porosity. They talk about density and porosity, but these are in terms of, of mechanical properties, not in terms of defect. Look over to the next page where it says properties related to stress resistance. You've got compression, shear, bending, tension, fatigue, torsion. These are all mechanical properties, and they have, a, uh, they have figure 339 up in the right-hand corner that illustrates those. Here's what I want you to know. No plasticity. That's a bullet. The ability of a material to deform without breaking is its plasticity. 
metals have plasticity. Um, these rubber bands have plasticity, and it's a good way to describe plasticity in steels. I can take and I can stretch them, but then when I let go, they go back to their original form. Metal will too, to a certain extent. You can, you can pull a metal apart through a tension bender, our tension puller, and then let off of it. And because these, we, we talked earlier about atoms having, having an attractive force, that attractive force will bring that metal back to its original shape. Now, if you keep on pulling, then you've reached its yield point and you go from plastic to what they call elastic behavior. Uh, so know what plasticity is. It's the point to which you can stretch it without breaking it. Elastic, there's no permanent deformation. Uh, plastic is permanent deformation. Uh, elastic, here, this illustrates it very well. They have, a, they have a load here, and they add 100 pounds. That 100 pounds makes it stretch two thousandths of an inch. They doubled it. There's a direct correlation. So now, it's, now they've got 200 pounds. It stretched four thousandths of an inch. 300 pounds, it stretched 600. Uh, so now they're, they're 6, so now they're showing us a direct correlation between uh, uh, the applied force and the amount of stretch in steel, demonstrating its elastic ability. Strec strength, know what the definition of that is? Strength is the ability of a material to resist deformation. It is usually expressed as the ultimate tensile strength in pounds per square inch. The ultimate tensile strength of a material is its resistance to breaking. Uh, a more direct and I think easier thing to remember is the ability of a material to bear to bear an applied load. This table has got some tensile strength. It's 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 bearing an applied load. Uh, of course, it's a little different when we're talking about steel. But you can think of a bridge. That's a good example of, of a bridge having good tensile strength. Uh, two common methods of expressing it is ultimate tensile strength and yield strength. And if you ever look at any pipe certs, it'll tell you. Uh, if you've heard of like uh, X52 pipeline pipe, X52, well that's not 52,000 pounds tensile strength, that's 52,000 pounds yield strength. And then the tensile strength is, is a lot higher, about 66,000 pounds. So that if you get certs on, on steel products, they'll probably have both of these expressions on them. So know what strength is? Toughness, the ability to absorb energy. That table's pretty tough. That's toughness. It says, although there is no direct method of measuring the toughness of materials accurately, a material may be assumed to be tough if it has high tensile strength and the ability to deform permanently without breaking. Toughness may be thought of as the opposite of brittleness, since a tough metal gives a warning of failure through deformation, whereas a brittle material breaks without any warning. A good, a good way to describe this is if uh, I took a couple of, of steel pins. If I took a couple of steel pins and one was, one was tough and the other one wasn't, and I, and I put them in a clamp, and if I, if I hit them up here with a hammer, the tough pin would bend. It would deform, but not break. Whereas this one would shatter. So that's a good definition of toughness. It, it, will, it will fail slowly for you, as opposed to being brittle. Notch toughness. This is why I harp on undercut and other discontinuities like that, because they create stress risers, which affects a material's notch toughness. Toughness in the presence of surface notches and rapid loading, also referred to as impact strength. Um, impact resistance, I believe is what your book calls it. Uh, impact resistance may be defined as the ability of a material to withstand a maximum load applied suddenly. The impact resistance of material is often taken as an ind indication of its toughness. Next we have brittleness. I talked about a little bit here. This would be ductile and this would be brittle. And if you look at the microstructure here, you can see the crystalline structure of both. But here, the one that was ductile failed slowly, and that's why it tore and deformed. So you have these ears here. Now this one didn't. A good example of that would be, a, of a brittle failure, would be as if I, if I took a file and I snapped it over a piece of steel. It's just going to shatter because it has no ductility. It's brittle. But if I took, uh, uh, again, going back to, to one of these little pins and beat it with a hammer, 
It would, sure, it might eventually break in two, but it's going to do it real slowly. So ductile as opposed to brittle. So you need to understand and remember these, uh, these mechanical properties, because the, these are going to make a big part of your test. Hardness, the ability to resist indentation. Um, your book says the ability of one material to penetrate another material without fracture of either is known as hardness. I really don't like the way this, your book says it. This is much easier if you want to write that in, out, in the, out in the column someplace. The ability to resist indentation. That's a much more direct forward uh, uh, definition of it. And in fact, that may be how it's worded on your test. The ability to resist indentation. These are indenter types. They use them on, on uh, hardness testing. There's, a, there's, a, there's several different varieties of, of hardness testing that we're not going to go into right now. But those of you that take the inspection class will get a big dose of that. This is a, a picture of a hardness tester. And this is what some of the, the, the endpoints of, of these indenters look like. Ah, brings us to stress strain. Uh, let's see, malleability, skip malleability, elastic limit. Loading a material will cause it to change its shape. The ability of a material to turn to its original shape after the load has been re removed is known as elasticity. That's a bullet. The elastic limit is the greatest load that may be applied after which the material will return to its original condition. Uh, once the elastic limit of a material has been reached, it no longer behaves elastically. It will now behave in a plastic manner and deform permanently. For practical purposes, the elastic limit is required in designing because it usually it is usually more important to know what will load deform a structure than what load will cause a fracture or break. Modulus of elasticity. Um, I'm not going to ask you to remember this. I won't ask you a question on this, but those of you that take the inspection class will get it. Some materials require higher stresses to stretch than others do. In other words, some materials are stiffer than others. To compare the stiffness of one metal with another, we must determine what is known as the modulus of elasticity for each of them. The modulus of elasticity is the ratio of stress to strain. This is a stress strain diagram. Um, if the modulus is high, the material is more likely to resist movement or distortion. A material that stretches easily has a low modulus. And what they do is they'll, they'll, they'll try to stretch it, and so they're, they're applying stress. And then the amount of strain is, is recorded on the, uh, let's see. Okay, this is the stress, and this would, this would be the strain. And you can actually chart this out, and it'll make a graph for you. Uh, but I, I threw this slide in to show the stress-strain curve. And steel, for example, would have a large stress-strain curve. Um, molybdenum would have a smaller one because it doesn't have the, the uh, uh, modulus of elasticity that steel does. But uh, I threw this up here also to, to illustrate the yield point, which, are, which is our next topic. This one you will need to put a bullet by. When a sample of low medium carbon steel is subjected to a tension test, a curious thing happens. As the load on the test specimen is increased slowly, a point is found at which a definite increase in the length of the specimen occurs. Uh, with no increase in the load. The load at this point expressed in pounds per square inch is called the yield point of the material. Non-ferrous metals and types of steel other than low and medium carbon steels do not have a yield point. Um, so what we do is when I put something in, in the tension puller and I'm pulling that apart, if, if I had a graph hooked up to it, you would see this. It would shoot that the, the, the load would shoot up really high until it would keep on stretching but it wouldn't go any higher. And if we were to stop at that point and measured, measured that stuff, you would see that it's still stretching, but it's no longer taking any more force to stretch it. That's because we've gone from elastic to plastic. We've created that permanent deformation, and it's still just going to go ahead and stretch out with what's already been applied. That's its yield point. And that's what this, this shows us right here, is the yield point. I think I might have another one on that. Oh, ductility is next. Skip resilience, go to ductility. Ductility is the ability of a material to be permanently deformed by loading and yet resist fracture. When this happens, both elongation and reduction in area take place in the material. The amount of stretching is expressed as percent elongation. You may hear, get a question to the effect that says, uh, percent elongation is related to what material property? You may get something like that on your test. 
Uh, metals with high ductility may be stretched, formed, or drawn without tearing or cracking. Gold, silver, copper, and iron metals uh, have good ductility. The ability of a metal to deform without breaking, that's ductility. There's actually another term in here. Uh, I don't know if a book's going to talk about uh, percent elongation or reduction of area later. Redu reduction of area, if you've ever seen me do one of these tensile pulls, I've got a specimen here someplace. Aha. If you've ever seen me pull one of these things apart, when it says percent elongation, what you would do is you would put a, put a dot here and a dot here, you'd put it in your machine, you would measure that distance, and then you stretch it, and then once it finally broke, you would take these two separate pieces and hold them back together, and you would see that these two dots had moved farther apart. So that means it elongated, however, what that percentage is. When they talk about percent elongation, that's what they're talking about. If, if those dots started out at eight inches apart, and when we were done, they were suddenly 10 inches apart, when we put the two pieces back together, we had a 25% elongation. But another thing that happens that I don't think your book talks about is the uh, uh, reduction of area. Because as this thing is stretching, this neck becomes narrower. It necks down. And that's another way that you can, you can uh, test um, ductility is the percentage of uh, um, reduction of area there. So, questions? Okay. Fatigue strength, uh, the strength of metal when exposed repeated to reversals of cyclic st stresses. Well, I'm always talking about if you make a weld and it's on a skid and it's sitting there vibrating all the time, it's under fatigue stress because it's being vibrated. It's, it's, it's like the example on that crane out there where the flex on that wire back, that's fatigue. You're just subjecting it to fatigue until it finally fails. So know what fatigue failure is. Uh, know what fatigue limit is. And especially, this will be, certainly be on your de uh, test, endurance limit of a material. What is the endurance limit? Endurance limit. Here's my definition. You might want to write it off in the, in, in the side column. Maximum stress at which no failure work, will occur regardless of the number of cycles. So we could, look, we could run it from here till the next century and it would still not fail. That's its endurance limit. Okay, let's drop down to uh, effects of common elements on steel. These are some of the most common elements in steel. Carbon, as I've been saying all along, most important. And you may get a question to that effect. What is the most important element in, in steel? Carbon. Uh, silicone, phosphorus, no, sulfur, phosphorus, silicone, uh, manganese, then no, magnesium, and chrome. And these are what they're what they do, what they do to steel. Sulfur is undesirable, phosphorus is undesirable. Silicone is used as a deoxidizer. Magnesium is used, uh, combines with the sulfur so it helps to neutralize it. Chrome uh, is good to, for better hardenability, hardenability and corrosion resistance. Uh, molybdenum is good for hardenability. Nickel is good for toughness and ductility. Aluminum is a good deoxidizer. Vanadium is good for hardenability and niobium is a stabilizer. Another name for niobium is columbium. And in welding, columbium is, when you're welding stainless steels, columbium will combine with carbon and therefore reduce carbon in the weldment, which helps to control sensitization, which is something we'll talk about after a while. Um, bullet by carbon. You need to know what carbon is. Skip boron, bullet by silicone. Need to know what silicone does. Uh, skip phosphorus. Skip sulfur. Um, selenium. This element is used interchangeably with sulfur in some stainless steels to promote machinability. Bullet magnesium. The middle of that paragraph reads, today 
It is one of the most useful metals for alloying steel. The addition of magnesium, or pardon me, manganese, increases both tensile strength and hardness. Uh, the alloy is a steel that can be readily heat treated. Special care must be exercised in welding since manganese steels have a tendency to porosity and cracking. Molybdenum, uh, if you've heard of chrome moly steels, molybdenum is used quite a bit in, in alloying steels. Molybdenum is a silvery white metal that increases the toughness of steel. This is a bullet by molybdenum. Since it, is, since it also promotes tensile strength in steels that are subject to high temperatures, it is an alloying element in pipe where high pressure and high temperature are common. Molybdenum also increases the corrosion resistance of stainless steels. Chromium. I think next to copper, this is the most important ingredient. It says chromium. This is definitely a bullet. It is the principal element in the straight chromium and nickel chromium stainless steels. The addition of chromium to al low alloy steels increases the tensile strength, hardness, and resistance to corrosion and oxidation. Ductility is decreased. This is true both at high and low temperatures. Drop down to the last paragraph on that topic and highlight that. It says steels that contain chromium are easily welded if the carbon content is low. However, the presence of a high percentage of carbon increases hardness. Thus, preheating and sometimes post-heating -heat are required to prevent brittle weld deposits and fusion zones. The biggest thing with welding stainless steel is what happens afterwards. If you don't do it right, you can rob it of its, of its corrosion-resistant properties through sensitization or carbide precipitation, which is, again, something we'll discuss in a, in a minute. Nickel, know what nickel is. You can skip niobium and cobalt. Um, skip copper, put a bullet by aluminum. Know what aluminum does. And then go over to tungsten. There'll be a question on tungsten. So read about tungsten. And then finally on 92, vanadium. Bullet by vanadium. Vanadium is a pretty important one. Just a quick thing on nickel. Corrosion resistant, good low temperature properties, and good high temperature properties. Copper alloys, good electrical conductivity, resistance to corrosion, resistance to erosion, resistance to water and salt water. Other common alloys uh, used in steel are aluminum, pure aluminum, aluminum copper, uh, aluminum manganese, copper, pure copper, brasses and bronzes. And then we get to the low alloy steels. Questions so far? We're almost done. Okay, types of steels. Where it says carbon steels, drop down to the last sentence in that and put a bullet by it. It says carbon steels are usually divided into low carbon steels, medium carbon steels, and high carbon steels, and tool steels. I'm interested in the first three, and you may get a question to that effect. Then it goes on to talk about low carbon steels. Bullet, because you need to know what low carbon steels are. Those steels whose carbon content does not exceed 0.3% and may be as low as 0.03% are low carbon steels. They are also referred to as mild steels and plain steels. Know those terms as well. Medium carbon steels, bullet. Medium carbon steels are those steels that have a carbon content range of 0.3% to 0.6%. They are considerably stronger than low carbon steels and have higher heat treatment qualities. Uh, so, some hardening can take place when the steel is heated and quenched. They should be welded with shielded metal arc, low hydrogen electrodes, and other low hydrogen processes. More care must be taken in the welding operation, and best results are obtained if the steel is preheated before welding and normalized after welding. The reason for that is we talked about carbon being the most important ingredient. Anytime you get above 0.4% carbon, you have, a, you have the probability, well not probability, the possibility of cracking. And so that's why you have to take special care when you're welding medium or high carbon steels. Um, and you have to follow preheat and post-weld heat treat applications in order to keep that from cracking. High carbon steels bullet, steels whose carbon content ranges from 0.6% to 1.7% are known as high carbon steels. 
They are more difficult to weld than lower medium carbon steels. They can be heat treated for maximum hardness and wear resistance. Preheating and heat treatment after welding eliminates hardness and brittleness at, at the fusion zone. Uh, these steels are used in springs, punches, dies, tools, military tanks, and structural steel. Okay, somewhere in here it tells us that low carbon steel is by far the most common. Something like 80% of, uh, of all welding in, in the world is done on low carbon steels. You'll need to find that in your book because I'll probably ask that as a question. Which of these steels would be the most commonly used in the United States or in the world in weldments? Okay. Which brings us to high strength, low alloy steels. Well, this one is low alloy. They have high strength, low alloy, automotive and machinery, low temperature, elevated temperature, good quality. High alloy steels are corrosion resistant, high temperature, and high strength. Um, there, you're you're going to see this a lot in your careers. They're abbreviated, abbreviated like so, high strength, low alloy. You'll see that. You'll just see those letters, and you know they're talking about high strength, low alloy. And these are steels that might be a mild steel, but they might have, say, 2.5% chrome in them. Okay? Well, that chrome is to improve its its uh, uh, high heat application properties. So here's, you, you could weld that with a 7018, but because it's got chrome in it, they're going to put a suffix after that B3. If you see that, you know it's a two and a half chrome material that you're welding on. So this would be a high strength, low alloy steel. And there's a whole family of them. I'm not gonna go into them, but I just wanted to fix in your minds that well, what they are and how you would weld them. You could still weld them with 7018, but because the filler metal has to match the, the, the mechanical and, and uh, chemical properties of the base metal, you'd have to do it with one that's got two and a half chrome in it. Otherwise, you're not going to match it properly, and that would be a weak link in the weldment. So, high strength, low alloy uh, steels make up a group of steels with chemical compositions specifically developed to give higher physical property values uh, and material greater corrosion resistance than are obtainable from carbon steel group. These steels contain, in addition to carbon and manganese, other alloying elements that are added to obtain greater strength, toughness, and hardening qualities. Um, stainless steels bullet, actually double bullet because uh, over the section on stainless steels it goes on for a number of pages. All the way, let's see, it goes over till all the way to 97. Uh, I'm going to ask six questions out of this section on stainless steels. Uh, I'll direct you a little bit. <clears throat> on the top of the next column, the, the second sentence says 11 and 5 tenths percent chromium is generally accepted as the dividing line between low alloy steel and stainless steel. Well, we say that by definition, a stainless steel has at least 12% chromium. Okay? It's not a stainless steel if it doesn't have at least 12% chromium. Your book says it a little bit differently. So you're going to get a question on that. What defines a stainless steel? 12% chromium defines a stainless steel. Okay? Um, drop down to where it says the uses for stainless steels are many. And there are many varieties to choose from. Stainless steels have the following advantages. Read those. There will probably be a question coming out of there. Stainless and heat resisting steels are commonly produced in finished forms such as plates, sheet, strip, bar, etc. These steels fall into five general classifications according to their characteristics and alloy content. 5% uh, chromium and hardenable are martensite 500 series, martensite 400 series, and so forth and so on. And if you look here, stainless steels contain at least 12% chrome. There's austenite, martensite, ferritic, precipitation hardening, and duplex. I would make sure you know, know that there are five types of stainless steel. This is, after all, a class on stainless steel. So you should know that there are five types of stainless steel. Then read about the, uh, about the different series of stainless steel and you will definitely have a couple of questions coming out from the austenite series on page 95. There'll be a couple of questions on austenite.
Now, I talked about sensitization of austenitic alloys. Uh, formation of chromium carbides occur between 800 and 1600 degrees. So let's go back to our welding metallurgy for just a second. Iron, that's the chemical symbol for iron. But if you have this, you have an iron carbide. And what happens is you'll get, uh, you get, it is three iron atoms and one carbon atom forms a chrome, no, chromium, chromium. Yeah, that's right. It's a chromium carbide. And what, what happens is, as you're welding on stainless steel and you pass through this temperature range, chrome has an affinity for iron. It sucks it up like a sponge. And that causes the formation of chromium carbides. And these chromium carbides then, uh, since they're forming, that chrome is no longer free to do the, its corrosion resistant properties. It, 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 it robs it of that. And so that leads to sensitization, which looks like this. Corrosion attack on austenitic stainless steels. Now along this edge here, you can see your weld metal here and here, and you can see that this was welded from two different sides. Well, of course, this is, its, this is the heat affected zone out in here, right? Well, as this stuff was being welded and the temperature went up above 800 degrees, you pass through that sensitization zone. And that's when those uh, um, carbon car carbides form. And what it is, it sucks up the chromium out of here, and then it gets attacked by, it's in a corrosive environment, and this was probably a piece of pipe or something, it's in a corrosive environment, and that corrosion, because there's no chromium here to stop it, that corrosive environment ate it away. So it's, you got to be very careful about welding stainless steels and avoiding this. Uh, it, it will attack and destroy uh, stainless steels over time if, if, you have, if you've sucked that chromium out of there as you go through those ranges. Uh, of, to avoid it, you can use heat treatment, stabilized grades of stainless steel and low carbon grades of electrodes. Anytime you see a stainless steel electrode, and let's say it's 308L, the L means it's a low carbon. And it's going to have 0.03 or less of carbon in it. So it doesn't have much carbon for the chromium to bond to. And so that would help to reduce that uh, chromium carbide uh, formation. So definitely know about that because there will be a question about synthesization on your test. And I don't think your book really talks about it. But as I mentioned earlier uh, in the school year, a, a lot of things uh, that I'm going to ask you about or some things I'm going to ask you about may not be found in your book. Okay. Let's see what's next. Tool steel. I'm not really interested in tool steel. I'm not going to ask any questions on that because this is a class on stainless. This is important though, carbon equivalency. I mentioned earlier that if the carbon content gets over 0.4%, then you can have cracking. Well, you could have a carbon that has only 0.15. You could have a, you could have a mild carbon steel. Well, that's way below 0.4%. But all these other things, oops, I, got, I, I guess I grabbed the wrong, the wrong one. All these other things, um, manganese, uh, chrome, vanadium, if you can put certain amounts of elements together and you have to, there's a formula where you would divide, and this is in your book here, where you would have to divide and you could f calculate the percentages and all these taken together along with the carbon could be more than 0 0.4. So it's called a carbon, carbon equivalency. Even though you might be using a low carbon steel, if you have the, the right amount of these other alloying elements, it could equal a high carbon steel. So this is where your carbon equivalency comes from. And there will be a question on your test. I'm actually going to write, you a, write this formula out and ask you to substitute certain amounts of different elements and calculate that. So bring your calculator to do this, this test because you will have to work that formula. Okay. Let's skip this part on, uh, on the steel numbering system. We'll pick that up when we do the inspection class. Uh, go to page 105. Read about all these different types of, of iron. There'll be a couple of questions coming out on the iron here. 
So read about those. Page 107, aluminum making in the United States. Um, who's the largest producer of aluminum? They're found in the United States. Uh, over the next column it says, production of aluminum is done across four-fifths of the country, leaving out only Maine, Vermont, North Dakota, Wyoming, Nebraska, New Mexico. We're the only states in the Union that don't make aluminum. The primary products produced uh, and their industrial applications are sheets, plates, foil, rod, extrusions. Nearly two-thirds of the annual production is used in the transportation uh, container packages and building construction industries. The remainder of the production goes into the following industry segments, electrical, consumer durables, and so forth. Um, there will be three questions coming out on this section on aluminum. Over on the next page it says the recycling of aluminum is very important because of the environmental as well as the economic impact on the product. Uh, the amount of aluminum that has been recycled in the last decade has doubled, et cetera, and so on. Types of aluminum. Uh, bullet, a four-digit numbering system used to identify pure aluminum, rod aluminum alloys. On t you can see right there on, on table 323. It's right next to where I'm reading. The first digit indicates the major alloying group. For example, one triple X identifies the aluminum that is at least 99% pure. Two triple X is an aluminum with copper as the major alloying element and so forth. Bullet, the three categories of aluminum that find the most welding applications are commercially pure aluminum, wrought aluminum alloys, and aluminum casting alloys. Then read about the various types of aluminum there. Um, so, so this is the numbering system here, pure aluminum, uh, manganese, silicone, magnesium, alloying elements. And 4043, is a very common aluminum. It's one of the most widely used, and, and, it's, and I don't see it in your book here, but 4043 with silicone is, the, is, is one of the most commonly used out there. Um, they have heat treatable aluminums, copper, magnesium, and silicone, and zinc aluminums. I think that's all of my slides. Wait, it might be one more. Skip uh, the section on titanium. Go to expansion and contraction. It's on page 111. Read about expansion and contraction and then distortion on the next page. Um, well, real quickly, what did I do with my pointer? Oh, well. As you dump heat, the coefficient of thermal expansion is going to cause this to grow, and you see where this colder area is restraining the heat. That causes it to bow up. And then as it cools, uh, it, it bows back in the opposite direction, and then you, this little curly Q thing here looks like a spring is actually representative of stress, residual stress that is in the weldment. Uh, which brings us to page 112, distortion and stress in welding. Um, understand, put a bullet by distortion and stress. So read about that. Put a bullet by residual stress. Those are all on page 112. We've already talked about yield point, coefficient of thermal expansion, thermal conductivity, and modulus of elasticity. Uh, types of distortion, there's lengthwise shrinkage, transverse shrinkage. Put a bullet by warping on page 115. Understand what warping is. Understand what angular distortion is. Uh, let's see. Prevention of distortion before welding. There's pre-bending. That's simply where you set, set stuff in such a way that when, when you weld it, it'll pull back into, back into alignment. Put a bullet by strong backs. I'm going to want to know if you know what strong backs are. Uh, over in the next column where it says distortion control during welding, you should know what chain intermittent fillet welds are, and you should know what staggered intermittent fillet welds are. Then under summary of distortions control, uh, metal expansion, put a bullet. Then over on page 119, 
put a bullet by end fixing. It's in the second column. And then the one that says avoid over welding. Okay. And then on page 121, I'm going to ask a couple of questions on post heating. Cold peening, vibratory stress. Those are all stress relieving techniques. Preheating, post heating, cold peening. We've already talked about annealing and vibratory stress. There'll be a couple of questions on on controlling residual stress. So uh, page 120, 121, 122, you'll have a couple of questions coming out of those that's just that's talking about a variety of different stress relieving methods after you've completed the weld. And I'm going to ask a couple of questions on that. Okay, any questions? Thanks, sorry it took so long. <laughs>